Right, welcome everybody. Um, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Okay. okay. I hope everyone's back. All right, uh, let's resume. So, um, yeah, in the previous lecture, we uh, we just covered the scripture references, uh, one of the first uh, old Old Testament references of uh, the origins of praise from Genesis 29, from the, from the life of Leah. Um, and then in Psalm 114 verse 2, we see that how Judah or praise becomes God's sanctuary um, from a very physical thing in Exodus 25 and how it changes that in praise is where God dwells. Uh, in, in other words, praise is the atmosphere of heaven. Praise is the sound of heaven. Praise is God's address, right? Uh, you want to find where God is, uh, praise him or join a bunch of people who are praising him. Uh, you'll find him, right? Uh, in Isaiah 60 verse 18, I'll just let me put it up there for us. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18, he says, you shall call your gates praise. Uh, Psalm 118, verse 19 says, open for me the gates of righteousness. Okay. Another name for gates of praise is gates of righteousness. Uh, I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Um, and another scripture that I'm reminded of is uh, Isaiah 61, verse 3, uh, where praise is referred to as a garment. Okay, Isaiah 61, verse 3, I think. Okay, okay. put on a garment of praise. Okay, uh, we when, when do we use a garment to cover ourselves, right? To you know, clothe yourself with a garment of praise, insulate yourself. Okay, um, let everything about you be praised, praise to God. So, um, so yeah, that's that's like the foundation uh, we are laying, brick by brick by brick by brick by layer by layer. We see that praise first of all shifts our focus. Uh, you know, and then when we do that, God honors us in a way that only he can. Okay. And then it goes on to say that he dwells in the praises of his people, right? In Psalm 114 uh, and all these verses that we just mentioned. Um, and another translation, I like this Psalm 22, again, verse three says, uh, he inhabits the praises of his people. Um, that means, uh, he actually another translation says he consumes the praise, right? So when God does that, when God consumes our praise, he's not only consuming our praise, but he consumes the praiser as well. Okay. Um, so there was a few scriptures that we saw. Uh, and from the New Testament, we see Jesus quoting Psalm 8 verse 2 from the lips of of children and infants, I have ordained praise. And, and, and that Psalm goes on to say, with my praise, you have silenced my enemies. I mean, just look at that picture the God is painting, isn't it? Children, infants are helpless. They cannot defend themselves. They cannot fight for themselves. But in such weak people, weak creatures, so to say, that he has ordained praise. Um, and so, Again, praise is in a way shown that it's it's a weapon of warfare, right? Um, so we stopped there and uh, we saw that there are multiple reasons for us as human beings that we praise him for. And which is all good. We praise him for his mighty acts, mighty deeds, wonderful deeds. We praise him because he saves us. Uh, we praise him for, uh, you know, that he's given us his grace, his, his, his mercy, and he is faithful towards us, etc., etc., isn't it? And then we stopped at that heaven has only one reason. And that is, they praise him because he is worthy. That's it. 
Okay, and uh, that word worthy uh, in the Christian circle uh, is very famous, very popular. Is it? There are like a thousands of songs on uh, where we sing, you know, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy, you know, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what if I were to ask, okay, what comes to your mind when we say that Jesus is worthy? And if I were to ask, why do you think he's worthy? What would your answer be? Because he took the cross for us. Yeah. He's almighty. He bore the cross for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. He's a holy God. Yes. Thank you, Rosalind. Okay. What else, guys? Come on. Why is he worthy? I hope you haven't seen the notes yet. But <laughs> Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Divya has seen the verse. Okay, I have notes. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. But yeah, thank you, Divya. Uh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah. <sighs> I'm just kidding, Divya. It's okay. <laughs> there is none like him. Yeah. There is none like him. Um. Because like all of us, you know, in class, all every twenty-two of us, uh, besides me, I want you to ponder on His worth when we sing or when we say that He is worthy. Um, it it should mean something, isn't it? Uh, it's okay. So now, with that in mind, let's try and uh, look at the notes that we have. Um, now, I thought that okay, it'll be. Uh, it'll be good for us to kind of go deeper and do us just study <clears throat> on the topic of the worthiness of Jesus. Um, um, yeah, it should uh, it it should help us in uh, you know just understanding a little bit uh, about the subject. Okay, I hope you all can see. So. The worthiness of Jesus. We sing that he is worthy and we saw that heaven has only one reason and that he is worthy, right? Um, the few uh, scriptures that we mentioned there, we'll go there in just a second. But, but on a daily basis, we use that word worthy every now and then, isn't it? Some of the words that's mentioned uh, you know, in the doc is um, praiseworthy. Is that, is that person worthy of praise? Is that thing Worthy of praise, uh, credit worthy, trustworthy. Hey, again, is that person trustworthy? Or is that person worthy of my trust? Isn't it? Um, note worthy, road worthy. Hey, is that car road worthy? I mean, can I take it and go on the road and I can uh, and know that it won't break down? Uh, sea worthy. I mean. Uh, the Navy's uh, seals, they always use it, isn't it? The Army people, the Navy people say, is that ship seaworthy? Uh, is she seaworthy? Okay, that means, is is that ship worthy enough to be taken into the, into, into the high seas, dangerous and stormy seas? Um, so they ask that question, uh, is that airplane airworthy? Uh, is that worth it? Is that worthwhile my time? Uh, is that movie worthwhile my time? Uh, is is that thing worth the price that I have to pay? Is that watch worth it? Is that computer worth it? Uh, is that person worth my time? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we use those words, isn't it, uh, so often uh, in our conversation. Maybe not every day, uh, maybe every day, you never know. Right? But those are some of the words, just some. It's not an exhaustive list, but uh, just some of the words with the word worthy in them. And all of that uh, you know, defines something, means something. Uh, you know, and all of those words can be pondered upon uh, and, and you know, studied upon. Okay? But let's dive in a little bit more deeper. Uh, who he is, it's all about Jesus, okay? The worthiness of Jesus. Who is he and why is he worthy? Um, so just a brief summary of what is happening in the, in the book of Revelation from chapter four to chapter seven is we see that there are seven hymns. 
okay seven songs uh, basically so hymn number one in revelation four and eight revelation chapter four verse eight we see uh, the four living creatures singing them isn't it so actually let's go to the book of revelation and i love it i love it does anybody else love these hymns Okay, I saw a raised hand. Uh, was that by mistake? Sorry, sir, by mistake. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Okay, that's hymn number one. And hymn two is just a couple of verses below. Now the 24 elders are singing, from verse 10 to 11. It says, the 24 elders fall down before his who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Okay? You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Okay, and hymn number three in chapter five, verse eight and nine. Okay, I, I hope all of you all are having your Bibles handy and so you're following along with me. Okay, Revelation chapter five, yes. verse eight to nine. Thank you. Where am I? Okay, yeah, there, verse eight. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders. So now there's a combination of living creatures and elders singing this hymn. Okay, each one had a harp instrument and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's why incense is related and symbolic of intercession prayers, right? And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Okay. Hymn number four, same chapter. Let's come down to verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The angels are singing. To receive the power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Okay, so in the previous chapter, chapter 4, verse 11, the elders sang, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. They stop there. But here, the angels are singing, you are received. You're worthy. Worthy is the land that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength. A couple of words that was not there. In honor and glory and praise. Okay. And in that same chapter, verse uh, chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. Wow. Okay, so I think we get an idea. So far in hymn number one, hymn one, we see only the living creatures crying out, holy, holy, holy. In hymn two, we see the 24 elders crying out, you are worthy to receive honor and glory and power. In hymn three, we see living creatures and the elders join in. And then we see the multitude of angels join in. In hymn five, we see all of creation, everything, 
on earth, below the earth, in the sea, everything in it. And then in hymn six, we see that the human multitude join. And in hymn seven, everybody join in. The angels, the elders, and the living creatures. Okay? So in all of these hymns, there are five main ascriptions made to Jesus. The worthy one. Blessing, riches, and thanksgiving, or wealth. Honor, glory, wisdom, and power. And each of us is defined as this. Blessing, riches, and thanksgiving is his personal wealth and the generosity with which he shares it. His honor, his exalted position due to the esteem in which he's deservedly held. Glory, his personal splendor in the unfolding of the perfections of his character. Wisdom, his infinite knowledge and his perfect application in every instance. Power, strength and might, the authority he wields and the absolute right to use it. So what we have there is every possible qualification for worthiness. All of this is that every possible qualification for worthiness. Uh, in, I'm just, you know, in, in Revelation chapter 5, right, uh, in the second, uh, sorry, the third hymn, it says, um, the living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, right? And they sang in verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Okay? And I thought it's very important for us to understand this imagery is, now, uh, I think in the 70s, I'm not sure, or 80s, they found one of the scrolls of Caesar, Okay. I don't know which Caesar, Augustus or Julius, I'm, I'm not sure. Now, only a person from the lineage or a descendant of Caesar can open that scroll because his inheritance would be written in the scroll. Not anybody you know, could, uh, can open it. That person would be worthy if they are from the if they are from that person's lineage uh, or descendant. Only they are found worthy. And here we see that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, because of the Lamb that was slain, that made him worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Because now he has won the inheritance. He is worthy. Okay. Um, Let's get no, I shared um, a separate PDF on um, in the stream section asking you all to download. Um, so this is, yeah, these notes, what you're seeing on the screen is not in the actual notes, uh, in, in the course notes, but it's something that's extra, which I have shared in the stream section. So I request you to kindly download the PDF. Okay, but for now, you can just follow along with the page that I'm there, but you can download it later on. Is everybody okay with that, guys? I uh, hope you. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Tsigino, are you okay? Did you did I make it clear? Yes, Pastor. I was just asking in which page we are. Yeah. Uh, this is the very first page of the document that I shared on the stream section. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, so I hope you all are with me so far. And, you know, these five things that we see that, uh, that the angels and the elders sing is the every possible qualification of worthiness. Uh, and Matthew Henry, he actually says uh, in his commentary, um, he is worthy of that office and that authority which require the greatest power and wisdom, the greatest fund, all excellency to discharge them aright. And he is worthy of all honor and glory and blessing because he is sufficient for the office and faithful in it. 
It's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, he is sufficient for that office and faithful in it. He is worthy. He is, he is it. He is absolute. That's it. Right? And um, so let's move on. As we all know, that English word worship comes from this Anglo-Saxon word, means worthship, which means ascribe to or give worth to. And that's why worship is so, so much related to, you will give your worship to something or someone that you see is worthy. Okay, so uh, worship is at the core of our being in, in life. All of us are worshipers by nature uh, and because we've been ordained. Uh, God's ordained praise in our mouths, in our lips. We look for something to give our life away. Uh, every human this is, okay? They just want to find something or that someone to just give their life away, to just throw their worship at their feet. We, typ we typically determine what the thing will be based on our assessment of value. Whatever we deem most valuable, you will give yourself away to it in a form of worship. Okay, uh, because worship and worship is so related, I wanted to do this word study on the worthiness of Jesus and why why we uh, why we say that He is worthy. Okay. Um, one of the keys of life is making the right thing the object of worship, which relates back to value. Uh, and like I said some time ago, uh, that I like this scripture from Luke chapter 19, verse 39 to 40. Okay, Luke chapter 19, verse 39 to 40. Uh, just the, con um, the context there is... Jesus and his disciples are entering Jerusalem. That is the Passion Week. That is the week that Jesus is going to be crucified, right? Um, which is popularly, famously known as the Passion Week. And as they enter in, the people and the crowd are praising him, but uh, Pharisees are not happy with that. Okay, they say like, hey, Jesus, stop the crowd from praising you. You know, just, just tell them to stop. And Jesus very famously responds like, hey, if they don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. Uh, okay, the, and the idea is that praise must come forth to the object that is most worthy of this praise. Okay, Christ, Jesus is worthy of everything because of who he is. And the rocks know it. Okay, Jesus is worthy of everything simply because of who he is. And the rocks know it. Right? Um, and secondly, he is worthy for what he has done. Um, the main thing the elders say that Jesus has done to manifest his worthiness is that he was slain. We read that in chapter 5, verse 7 to 10, isn't it? Uh, redemption was the greatest act ever accomplished. Now, the Greek word um, axios carries with it the idea of something that is weighed to evaluate its fitness or appropriateness uh, simply means its worthiness. Okay, that's what the word axios means, okay, to weigh something. And on the cross, Jesus was weighed and found uniquely qualified to bear the sin debt of mankind and to pay it all once and for all. And now in heaven, he approaches the Father and he is the only one who is worthy. It's like that weighing thing, right? On one, on one scale, there was the sin of the world. On the other, there was Jesus and his blood, which overweighs it and makes the sins of the world unworthy and makes him worthy. Right? Um, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain with your blood you purchased men for God. Amen. Um, and I just want to 
kind of conclude this sub, this topic here um, and not go too deep um, is from John chapter 12, verse 1 to 12. Uh, I'm choosing John for this passage uh, because John is the one who's writing the book of Revelation. And, and uh, there he writes about what Mary does. Um, you know, Mary breaks the alabaster jar. And uh, the other disciple says, why this waste? Right. And Jesus says that she is preparing me for my burial. That means Mary must have had this revelation that he is that innocent lamb that is going to be slain for my sin. And so she brings forth her worship while the other disciples saw it was a waste. She, you know, can, can you imagine that? It's, it's like, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm giving one of you a gift. Like I'm giving Tsikedno a gift, right? And the other person says, why are you wasting that gift? In other words, the person who is saying, why such a waste is actually saying, that person is not worthy. Are you all with me? And uh, you know how insulting that can be? And I don't know, I'm, I mean, I'd like to imagine when we know Judas made that comment. Can you imagine how insulting it must have been to Jesus to say, why are you wasting it? He's not worthy. Just uh, to see, to know that my God was insulted, um, to know that my King, my Savior, uh, who gave his life away, being insulted to be found not worthy or unworthy, uh, it just shatters, shatters me, breaks me. But that's something beautiful about Mary, is that she saw and she must have had this revelation of Jesus. And she feels, she brings this alabaster jar. Um, we will study about this in detail in another chapter, but I'm just saying she brings her, her best gift and she pours it at the feet of Jesus and uh, she worships him because she finds him worth it. Amen. Um, he's worthy of the biggest step of faith you've ever taken and will ever take and the greatest sacrifice you've ever made. He's more worthy than all of that. Amen. So I'm just going to stop sharing um, the screen here. So in brief, that's... Uh, even this study is just two pages. Uh, it's just a very brief study uh, or insight into for us to understand the worthiness of Jesus. Amen? Are you guys with me? Yep. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> So this is what's happening in heaven, right? This is the atmosphere in heaven. All of them see that Jesus is worthy. The blood of Jesus was not even for the angels. Angels don't understand salvation because the blood of Jesus was not for them. Angels don't need salvation. How much more how much more for us, that blood which was shed, how much more as we, as his people, for whom salvation was necessary, how much more should we understand and have that revelation of his worthiness? And I'm going to be bold enough and say that there can never be true worship of spirit and truth unless we have that revelation of the worthiness of Jesus. And when we have that, everything becomes 
everything changes. Every, you know, uh, you, you setting up the sound system in church, uh, you, uh, from setting up the chairs, from setting up the pews, cleaning the pews, cleaning the bathrooms, everything has a different meaning now because you don't, you're not doing it for your senior pastor or you're because you're a volunteer. But you are doing it because you find Jesus is worthy of that. And that is worship, isn't it? And that is the atmosphere of heaven. That is the sound of heaven. Everybody in heaven is resounding that Jesus, you are worthy. And that is their worship. Okay, so with that in mind, let's now let's go to our notes. Um, in our notes, we are in page 14 now. Okay, we are in page 14. Once we see that heaven has only one reason and that he is worthy, and we've just explored the worthiness of Jesus. And all of this is happening in Revelation 4, as it says, in the throne in heaven. Right? That's the headline in, in chapter 4, before it starts, is there's a throne that is set in heaven. Now, a throne, and the room where the throne is set is called the throne room. Duh. Right? The room where the throne is set is called the what? Throne room. Isn't it? That's where all of this worship, this extravagant, loud, and rich worship is going on. Where God is enthroned. And then we see in Psalm 22, verse 3, it says in the notes, I mentioned different translations of the same verse. You are enthroned on Israel's praises, but you are holy, O you that inhabit the praises of Israel. You dwell, you live in the holy places of the praises of Israel. You are in the midst of the praises of Israel. Okay, uh, where are we going with this? We saw that praise is God's address. That's the atmosphere of heaven. That is the sound of heaven, right? That's where he dwells, he lives, right? In the midst of praises. And that room is called the throne room, isn't it? Now, I wanted to show, let me, let me see if I can quickly show an Im image of an earthly uh, throne room, which is hilariously not magnificent, but uh, let's see. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, there we go, okay. I just Googled for a throne room uh, of the palaces uh, and this kind of, okay, so this is the throne room where the king and the queen resides, okay, they come in. So, um, and again, if you're looking at your notes, right, mentioned from biblical times to the present days, kings have had a physical place where they sit on a throne. Okay, uh, that place, that throne room would also be called as the presence chamber or the, the chamber of the face because the presence of the king or the face of the king was in that room. Okay, it was in that room where everything would be performed. He would grant audience of, uh, of another country, of another state, of another minister. It is in that room where you see, you, you'll find the ministers of the court of law present and all of them chanting, okay, praises to the king. And it is there where the king makes political decisions, uh, you know, for good, for the bad, for that country and everywhere and, and, and everything, right? And we see that in Psalm 22, verse 3, that God is enthroned on our praises. It simply means that when I praise him from this very room, okay, this, my office room, when I begin to praise him and say, God, you are awesome, you are magnificent, you are holy, you are all-powerful, you are worthy, God is beginning to dwell in my praises here. And all of a sudden, this room, just my workspace, 
is now his throne room because his presence is here. Isn't that awesome? Wherever you are, whatever place you are in, once you begin to praise him, his throne is being established in your physical space. Isn't that wonderful? Right? Um, I wonder how God still thinks of each one of us and takes care of every small and big detail in the midst of such an extravagant non-stop worship. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's mind boggling, isn't it? That, you know, with all these amazing worship that's going on, he's surrounded by the best worship team and the best sound of ever. And then as soon as I start, as soon I start praising him or we start praising him, he's like, Shh. he's like, Hey, you know, my son, my daughter is praising. I need to go there now and establish my throne there. Uh, when God shows up, when his throne is established, everybody knows that he is there. Okay. You don't have to worry about the enemy because he is running in the opposite direction because his throne is being established on your praise. I mean, just to think of that, it, 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 like you said, it's, it's, it's just, I'm not able to wrap my head around it. It's just too good, too good. Okay. Um, but there's a couple of important uh, lines for us to just remember there is, if God is enthroned on our praises, who is enthroned on your complaints? Okay, if one person, if something or someone is enthroned, something else is being dethroned. Right? So when, you, when, when, you, when God is being enthroned on your praises, the devil is dethroned. He's from your life. He's going. He's, he's, he's nowhere to be seen. But if God is enthroned on your praise, who do you think is enthroned on your complaints? And if you enter his gates with thanksgiving, God's gates with thanksgiving, whose gates do you think you're entering when you complain? Important questions to ponder on, you think? Yes. Um, I hope you, uh, everyone is still with me. Um, right. Elisha, Aradhana, are you guys all okay? John. Yeah. So um, towards the bottom of page 14, uh, just to move on uh, from the section, um, it's just a few distinctives of praise. Okay, so praise is extroverted in nature. Okay, so we know these words like extrovert and introvert, right? Um, so the character definitions, uh, you know, this is character tests that we can take. Are you an extrovert? Are you an introvert? You know, extrovert is all outgoing. It's like, I love people, you know, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Okay, introvert is like, no, I don't like people. I like, I like myself. I like the presence of myself, you know, and whatnot. But here we see that um, praise is extroverted in nature. Okay. Um, throughout Old Testament, the Hebrew people were very vocal in their expression of praise and adoration before God. That means um, the introverts did not have a choice. Like some people think they have a choice these days, right? In church, it's like, oh, you know, lift your hands. Like, no, brother, you know, I am actually an introvert. I don't like to lift my hands because basically I'm an introvert and whatnot. Uh, you know, when, when Psalm 100 says, shout for joy, Shabach for joy, all the earth, it doesn't just say shout for joy, all the extroverts. No. All you introverts become extroverts. Doesn't matter who you are. It's not up to you. It's, it's not like you have a choice. Praise is extroverted in nature. It's an invitation for all of us to be to come and express verbally and vocally. 
right? Uh, second point there, it, praises to be declared or manifested. Okay, let's quickly read Psalm 66, verse 8. I know there's a lot of there's been a lot of scripture reading today, but uh, I hope you guys are okay. Okay, Psalm sixty six verse eight. It says, "Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of His praise be heard." Okay, let the sound of His praise be heard. And Hebrews 13, 15 is something that we saw is talking about the fruit of our lips. It's a verb. It has to be declared or manifested. Um, it's very different uh, from, from just worship uh, as we saw in chapter one. Um, and then the third point is praise is based on who God is, not our feelings. Um, often we must will and determine to praise God even when we do not feel like it. We can't stress enough on the, of that, isn't it? Um, yeah, because uh, our situations, our circumstances change for good, for bad, but his worth never changes. He is always sovereign. Uh, he will always remain sovereign. Um, so he's worthy of our praise, isn't it? So some... Just to recap those points, the distinctives of praise is that praise is extrovert in nature. Okay, very it has to be seen and it has to be vocal. Uh, it has to be declared or manifested, and it does not depend on our feelings. Okay, um, and a couple of scriptures there mentioned for us to, uh, you know, for you to go back and read, uh, especially Habakkuk three seventeen and eighteen. Uh, would encourage you to read it when you can. Okay. And just a few more points to, for us to ponder on in page uh, 15, the next page in, the, in your notes, is why should we praise? Um, simply because we are commanded in his word to do so. And God is enthroned on our praises. Another reminder there is power in praise. We, we will learn more in detail about the power in praise in the next lecture, okay? And look at this, uh, that passage from Second Chronicles 20. And it is a good thing to praise God, point four. And we see that God is worthy of our praise and we were created to praise him, okay? So the six points there, uh, again, it's not exhaustive. It's just uh, for us to, uh, you know, understand a little bit. Once again, we are commanded to praise in his word. God is enthroned on our praises. There is power in praise. It is a weapon. It is a good thing to praise God. God is worthy of our praise, and we were created to praise him. Right? Uh, uh, what's one more thing that I wanted to uh, add for us uh, when God being enthroned on our praises is uh, when we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. It's, I mean, famous passage where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, right? Um, the disciples come and ask him, teach us how to pray. And then Jesus says, every time you pray to your father in heaven, this is how you ought to do so. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right now, the f the first section of that line is an address. Okay, you're addressing your Father, your God in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Okay, you're you're addressing. Uh, hallowed be your name. And this is where I think most of us kind of not misunderstand or don't fully understand is that we still think it is a continuation of an address. It's like, okay, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's like that one big line, but there's a comma. Our father in heaven address comma, hallowed be your name. And what follows that? 
your kingdom come, your will be done. Okay. His kingdom or his throne room will not come where his name is not hallowed. Okay, hallowed simply means exalted, magnified, praised. That's what it is. His kingdom comes to the place where his name is praised, where his name is hallowed, where his name is exalted, where his name is magnified above every other name. And he decides to show up. Okay, um, so we'll um, pause here because um, I feel like there's been a lot that we've had to absorb today, right? So we stop here at the point uh, in page 15. Why should we praise him? That's where we stopped. Okay, we'll continue looking at the other pointers as we uh, in in the in the next classes in the next lecture to come. Okay, um, is everybody doing? All right, uh, any questions, any thoughts, insights that you'd like to share? Hope you learned something today. Okay, if, uh, yeah, if there's nobody who wants to share anything, it's fine. We'll uh, pray and we'll bring the session to a close. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this word will bear fruit in our lives. Lord, I pray that everything that we have learned so far from your word, God, I pray that we will be able to put it into practice. God, I pray that in every difficult situation and circumstances, I pray Lord, that we will fix our eyes on you and praise you because you are worthy of it all, God. In every circumstance, in every situation, Holy Spirit, help us to fix our gaze on you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to do through our lives. We bless you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And uh, God bless you all. Have a lovely day and a lovely rest of the week. Stop the recording now. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you.